you would open your Bibles, Revelation chapter 2. <coughs> we're going to start in verse 8, 8 through 11, and we're going to look. Uh, I told you that we were going to look at these letters to the seven churches and try to get an idea out there of uh, the things that Christ likes about a church, the things that he doesn't like about a church. And last week we talked about leaving our first love. This, this week is a little more... <coughs> Excuse me, a little more unique because its situation um, is difficult for us to place ourselves into because we don't really suffer the kind of persecution uh, that these churches suffered. But we're gonna we're we're still gonna talk about that just just for a little bit. Revelation chapter two, starting in verse eight, and so let me read that. This is to the angel at the church in Smyrna. Write these things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but actually you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray together. Father, we just, uh, we just ask you to be with us today. We ask, um, we give your Spirit the freedom to work in our lives. Lord, everybody in here is in a different place um, in their life than everybody else. Different things going on. We just pray that you would have the freedom to work inside of us. We pray that you would have the freedom to, to change us, to change our minds, to change our hearts, and to change our lives. Just take your word, let your spirit apply it to each one of us, and let us by faith respond to you. We do love you, Father. We thank you for loving us. And it's your son, in your son's name we pray. Amen. So, uh, the background for this church, this church, Smyrna, was, it was a severely persecuted church. They were in a uh, a time uh, in Rome uh, where there was severe persecution. Um, they were kind of an economic center of, of where they were. So they were a very prosperous community. They had a lot of business. They had a, they had a lot of like shipping. and it, it was just a very prosperous community, a very prosperous city, um, very ungodly. Uh, they were, existed in a time when there was there was severe persecution. And he's, so he talks about knowing their tribulation and knowing their poverty. I'm going to talk about poverty just for a second. And I'm going to come back. and Because knowing their tribulation, I'm really going to take off on that and try to bring it home to us. Uh, but, but he says, I know your poverty. He says, but actually you're rich. You know, one of the main things that happens to Christians who live in places where persecution takes place is no one will support their business. And the same was true in Smyrna. You have these, these craft guilds and uh, these people over there are Christians. You do not go to their store. You do not buy from them. Uh, therefore, it affects the way that they can provide. It affects the way that they can provide for their families. Um, it affects their financial condition. That still goes on today. Uh, I can take you to uh, places in Southeast Asia and show you uh, Christian families who have a little store and nobody will come to it. Nobody will uh, support them in any way, shape, form, or fashion. It can take you to some little places in China. Actually, China's not as bad as, as, as Southeast Asia is because the church really exploded there years ago. But I chased a little rabbit there for a second. But it still happens today. Middle Eastern countries, listen, uh, if you are a Christian there, you can just almost forget surviving uh, if you have a business. They're just... They are not going to go to your store. They are not going to pay you for your services. They're not going to use your services. They're not going to buy your goods. They are just not going to do it. And it's for one reason and for one reason only. Because you claim the name of Christ. He says, I know you're poverty, but actually you're rich. You know, it's pretty ridiculous, but we actually do here, even in this country, as a church and as individuals. We kind of start looking around sometime and we go, man, we just don't have anything. We just, I, you know, I always joke, you know, we say, have you ever said, man, there's nothing in this house to eat? You ever said that? Have you ever heard that from the kids? There's nothing in this house to eat. I've said it plenty of times. There's nothing in this house to eat. 
The truth is, I probably have six months worth of food in my house when I say there's nothing in this house to eat. What I merely mean is there's no bluebell, you know, there's no Reese's. I mean, that, you know, that's what I really, really mean. There's nothing that I want to eat. Uh, but listen, as a church, we can start looking around and going, woe is me. And as Christian people, we can do that. But let's remember something. Our treasures are not the treasures of this world. And, you know, it's like, and I keep bringing up the prodigal son's brother. This is like the third time in a row. Third Sunday in a row, I brought up the prodigal son's older brother. Who, even though he stayed home, even though he stayed on the farm, even though he kept working for the father, yet he still never uh, received or took took hold of of all of the things that were available to him because his heart wasn't in tune with the father. And that's how we are as Christians, and that's how we are as churches. God has provided so many opportunities of blessings for us, and because our hearts aren't close to Him, we don't just reach out and take them. And, we're, and God's probably trying to say to us, just like he said to the older brother, don't you know that everything I have belongs to you? Don't you know that? Get it. Reach out there and take it. Ephesians uh, chapter 1, and I, and I think it's in the first two verses, it says that uh, Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I probably didn't tell you to do the next verse, did I? Or did I? It's a uh, day. He said, Blessed be, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We have every spiritual blessing that God wants us to have. But he says it's in the heavenly places. It's not necessarily the blessings of this world. It's not necessarily the things of this world. Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6 to not lay up for ourselves treasures uh, on earth where moss and ruth, uh, rust, ruth, where moth, it's hard to talk with a cough drop in your mouth, where moth and rust uh, corrupt uh, and, and destroy, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where these things aren't temporary. These things aren't, aren't uh, going to be destroyed and go away. And, and that where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. So here's the deal, church. When we start feeling, oh, Poor as us. I want to say poor as me. I don't think I've ever said poor as us before. Poor as us. Look how hard we have it. Well, maybe it's because we have placed our treasures on things that really aren't the things that really matter to God. We don't have enough money to do this. We don't have enough money to do that. We don't have enough money to do this. Okay, well, maybe we're not supposed to do this or maybe we're not supposed to do that. Maybe what we're supposed to do is take the blessings that God has for us through His Holy Spirit and distribute those spiritual blessings to our community. The spiritual blessings like the gospel. The spiritual blessings like prayer for people who are suffering through hard times. The spiritual blessings of prayer for people who are sick and need a touch of God. The spiritual blessings of just being a comforter to someone who's going through a difficult time. That didn't take any money. Didn't take any money at all. You know what? It costs you nothing to walk up to somebody and give them a hug. Just say, you know what? I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your mother. I'm praying for your grandmother. I'm praying for your kids. The first thing we want to do, and it's cultural, it's, a, it's our society. The first answer we think, the first answer to every problem is to throw some money at it. How about we throw the Holy Spirit at it? How about we throw the love of the people of God at it? How about we try to touch people where they really are with some compassion, with some grace? You see, the truth is we have everything that we need to be the people that we need to be for the kingdom of God. So this tribulation one, he says, I know your works, your tribulation and your poverty, though you're rich. This tribulation one is kind of the one that, that I'm going to kind of take off from and and bring it to us, uh, try to bring it to us. And again, you know, I wanted to talk about the suffering that Christians suffer around the world. And I do want to bring that up. You know, on Easter Sunday morning, we talked about uh, those churches in Sri Lanka that were bombed. And uh, they were bombed for one reason. 
because they hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And every place is not like America, y'all. In fact, 90% of religious persecution is against one religion. And you know what that religion is? It's Christianity. Obviously, in the Middle Eastern world, obviously your population of Christianity would not be very high. In the past, it's been, I think, around 20%. Some places now, it's like 2%. They are fleeing. People are fleeing their homes. They are fleeing their homelands because they go to prison, because they are tortured, and because they die or because they are left to starve and treated as outcasts. And for one reason and only one reason, because they hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I bring that up for two reasons. First of all, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3. <clears throat> He says this. He says, remember the prisoners as if you are chained with them and those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. These people, though they may live in Southeast Asia, though they may live in India, though they may live in Iran, they are part of the same body of Christ that you and I are a part of. There's not a lot that we can do physically to help them. But what they need from us more than anything is to not forget. And that's why the writer of Hebrews here says, remember those who are in chains just like you were chained up there with them. We need to remember these Christians who suffer. Can you imagine if they just came to your house one day, just forced their way inside, drag your kids outside and just said, you know what? You're going to denounce Christ today or we're going to cut your kids' heads off. It seems a bit extreme. We don't get it. I get that. But that is the reality that some people live in. Not in ancient Rome, but today today we need to remember them and here's where I really want to go with this and where I kind of want to apply it to us again that's not happening here we don't have to worry about anybody crashing in here and breaking up this meeting we don't have to worry about uh, whether or not we can share the gospel with somebody when we're over at Dairy Queen we really don't have to worry about all that I will say this though well I don't know might just be my little paranoia thing going on. I personally think it's coming. I personally think it's coming to the U.S. I personally think it is not going to be popular one day to hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, now everybody, we all, I mean, yeah, you're a Christian, that's great. You love Jesus, yeah, so do I. I may not act like it, but I do, you know. That's not going to be as... I don't think that's going to be as acceptable in the decades ahead. But here's the thing that I really, really want to start bringing around for us. What we have going on here in this world, there is a spiritual war that is happening. There is a spiritual battle that happens in the church, around the church, in communities, in nations, and in the entire world. And it is the battle of Satan against God for the souls of mankind. There is a very real battle. I have some, I, I have some verses here. The first one is Revelation chapter 12. And I'm not going to read this whole thing. But I do just kind of want to walk through it. If you have Revelation chapter 12, you can turn over there right quick. Revelation chapter 12 to me is sort of this... It's like a little short movie clip with, uh, I don't want to say cartoon images because that's not right, but, but it's with images that really is a history 
of spiritual warfare. Uh, that brings us up to right now. In verse 1 of chapter 12, it, it's talked about this sign that appears in heaven. And there's this woman and she's got this garland on her head with 12 stars. She represents Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Because it talks about her being with child. And in fact, in verse 4, it talks about her wanting to give her about to give birth to a child with a capital C. We know that to be the Messiah. We know that to be Christ. And so here's this woman. This is, and that's why I say it's a it's a it's an imagery kind of thing. So here's this woman. She's about to give birth. She's going to give birth to this child. We know him as as the Messiah. And there is this fiery red dragon who we found out in verse 9 is actually Satan. It's actually the devil. This dragon is waiting there because he wants to destroy this child as soon as it's born. And we know from scriptures that Satan did try to destroy Christ as soon as he was born. Uh, through Herod the Great, as he, through Herod, as he gave that issue. We're going to kill every, every newborn, two years old and younger. We're going to wipe them all out. But we know that God uh, warned Mary and Joseph in a dream. So here you have the, Satan. He's trying to kill Jesus. And he fails. Verses 7 through 12 are sort of the that war in heaven that we always talk about where, where Satan and a third of the angels fought against God and they were kicked out of heaven and they were thrown out. And when he was thrown out, he began to make war against Israel, this great beast. Uh, verse 13, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the child. He began to make war with Israel. Just look at Israel's history. You, you know, we always want, you know, how would you, I, I say this all the time, how would you like to be a country that's surrounded by people who simply want your complete annihilation? It's not that they want to get along with you. They don't want to get along with you. They want to annihilate you. They want to completely drive you off the face of the earth. The leader of Iran has publicly said as much. Uh, Saudi Arabia is not much better. Syria not either. None of them. They all want to completely destroy Israel. Why is that? That doesn't even make sense. Israel has the only piece of land in, in the Middle East that doesn't have oil, right? You know, so it doesn't even make sense why they would hate them so much. It's because it's spiritual. It's because it's the enemy. It's because the devil, it's because of Satan himself is at war against the people of God. And he is still at war today against the nation of Israel. Still today, to this very day. And not only that, but God has protected her and continue to protect her. And so in verse 17 of chapter 12, it says, And so the dragon was enraged with the woman. And listen to this here. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring. It's those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So now Satan has expanded his war to all who hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. If you claim to hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are in a war. You're in a war and you need to know it. You need to wake up to it. You need to understand and you need to stop looking at at the events that happen in the church and the events that happen around you is simply things like personality conflicts or, or this or that or however you want to sum it up. Listen, we're in a war and the enemy is to destroy us. You say, well, the enemy never battles, but never bothers me. That ought to tell you something right there. If you're in a war and the enemy isn't worried about you, there's a reason he ain't worried about you. Um... 1 Peter 5 8. You know this very popular verse. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaming lion, seeking whom he may devour. Let me let me tell you something else, too. You know, we like to talk in the church that Satan wants to destroy our witness. It's worse than that. Satan wants to destroy you. Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. A murderer. That's who he is. Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy the church. Not destroy its witness. He wants to destroy it. He wants to wipe it out. He wants to remove it. He wants... Y'all, we're in a war. I'm just trying to show us and prove to us that we are in a war. Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verse 12 
It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We're not in a personal battle. We're not in a physical battle. We're in a spiritual battle. And just like the, the uh, Hebrews passage said about being sober and being vigilant, we need to be on guard for that. And we need to be on watch spiritually to see how Satan comes against us, comes against our families, and comes against our church. Did you ever notice how... You go through a little period of time and God speaks to your heart and you're just like, you know what? I need to just surrender my life back to God. I need to give my life to, to God again. I, you know, I, I just need to renew my commitment and I need to make a real commitment to really follow Him. Did you ever notice how as soon as you make that commitment, it's like the next day, you have one of your worst failures that you've ever had. You have one of the worst failures that you've had. In years, you completely lose control. You just you just go completely off the rails with whatever area. Satan attacks all of us in different areas. We all have different areas of vulnerability that that the enemy comes at us because he knows we're vulnerable in that area. And it could be any number of things. But have you ever noticed when you really decide, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to start really doing the right thing and I'm going to start really following the Lord. It ain't two, three, four days later and you have Boom! Huge failure. It's not because you're not strong enough. Well, you're not strong enough in the flesh. But, but it's not just because you're not strong enough. It's not because your commitment wasn't real. It's not because you didn't mean it. It's because you are in a spiritual war. And we need to open our eyes to this spiritual war so that we can fight the spiritual battle so that we can be faithful to the end, which is what God tells the church of Smyrna there in Revelation. He tells them, he tells them in verse 10, don't be surprised that you're going to be delivered up. Let me, let me, let me read it exactly. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested. You're going to have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful to get and I'll give you a crown. In the, other, in the New Testament, Jesus said, in this life you will have tribulation. You will. Listen. It's because we're in a war. You ever notice how when a church decides, you know what, we're going to start praying. We're going to start being a praying church. Or we're going to start focusing on making sure that we are taking the gospel to people. We are really doing what God has called us to do. Did you ever notice? Man... Things can just fall apart and come unwound real quick in a church as soon as they make that decision. Did you ever notice that that can happen? You know why? It ain't because you got hard personalities. That ain't why it is. It ain't because you can't agree on this or that. I'm going to tell you why it is. It's because Satan goes on full-blown attack when you decide you're going to start praying and when you decide you're going to start taking the gospel to people, he's going to go on full-blown attack to destroy a church that's moving forward for God. We need to recognize it for what it is. We don't point fingers at another person. You point fingers at the enemy. You want to get mad at somebody Get mad at the enemy. I'm talking about the spiritual enemy. You want to have a complaint against someone, have a complaint against the enemy, the spiritual enemy. Because it's the spiritual enemy that would love to destroy this church. And especially as you, as you have decided that prayer is key and moving forward with the gospel is key. He's not going to sit back. In fact, well, it's just like I said. If the enemy's not if the enemy's not messing with us, it's because he ain't worried about us. If he's not messing with us, it's because he ain't worried about us. I pray we'll always have a little bit of enemy attack going on. That'll mean we're doing something right. That'll mean we're doing something good. But how about you, individually in your family? Be sober, be vigilant, he says in Hebrews. Be sober, be vigilant. 
It means be alert, be awake, and be aware that the enemy is trying to destroy. That the enemy is trying to get in. Don't let the enemy use you. Just don't let him use you. Don't let him use you to be an instrument of destruction in the church or in your family or in your workplace or in the community. See it for what it is. You know, I do want to make one more point. In verse verse 9, he tells the church, he says, I know your works. He says, I know. This is one thing I want you to understand. Whatever you're going through personally in your own life with the enemy after you, whatever we're going through collectively as a church, if the enemy decides, you, you know what? It's not lost on God. There's a couple of passages in the scripture that I really like. One is uh, from Exodus, and it's the very last two verses of Exodus chapter 2. And this is the children of Israel Israel have gone down to Egypt. They have been there for uh, a couple of centuries, several centuries. They have been oppressed and enslaved by the Egyptians. They've been crying out to God. And and it says it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the Then the children of Israel, listen, it says they groaned because of the bondage. They cried out. Their cry came up to God because of the bondage. And God heard their groaning. God remembered His covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And then it says, and God acknowledged them. He acknowledged them. God heard their groaning. And He looked down. It means He paid attention to them. That He realized they were hurting. I know sometimes we walk through the trials of life and we're just screaming. It's like our hearts and our spirits are just crying out to God. I'm telling you, God hears. And there's going to come a day when God's going to look down on you. He told them not to worry about it in Smyrna. He said, you're going to be delivered up for 10 days. It's just a way of saying there's going to be a period of time. But one day it's going to be over. One day it's going to be finished. One day God's going to look down and you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, that's enough. You've been through enough. Clearly, he said to the church of Smyrna, it's for your testing. Um, there's a passage in Mark chapter 6 and um, I didn't put the verse in my note it's, it's the passage where Jesus comes walking on the water and it's in Mark chapter 6 and they had just had a big day and Jesus had told the disciples get in the boat uh, go to the other side of the lake and Jesus went up on the mountain to pray and in the middle of the night a huge storm came up and, uh, and, was, and was just pounding them in the boat when they were out there On the middle of the lake. There it is. You got the verse. I guess I gave it to you, but I didn't put it in my note. It says that Jesus, he had been praying on the mountain. It says he saw them straying and rowing. He looked out on that lake and he saw them in that boat and he saw them struggling against that storm. Wherever you are in life, whatever storm you're struggling with in life, God sees you. He knows where you are. He knows what's going on. And just like in Exodus, He can say now is the time to deliver you. Just like right here in Mark chapter 6, He can come walking out there on the water. Just like the time they woke Him up in the back of the boat, He wiped His eyes a little bit, looked around, said peace be still. Everything was flat and quiet. He can do whatever He needs to do. I just want you to know that God knows what you're going through. I want you to know as a church that God knows your struggles. God knows what you're going through. And you know what? I think He sees us. And I think He says, you know what, First Baptist? What did I say a few weeks ago? What did God tell Moses there standing by the the Red Sea? What did He tell him? Why are you standing here crying out to me? What did He say? Tell the people to what? Tell the people to move forward. Tell the people to move forward. I believe God has a plan for this church. I believe God wants to use this church in a great way. It may not be great in the world's eyes. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. As long as it's great in God's eyes. As long as it does what God wants it to do. To take the gospel 
to whomever He puts in our path and puts in our hearts. Look, He tells them to persevere to the end and you're going to receive the crown of life. Like I said earlier, when you make a commitment, you know what? You're going to blow it. Just, you're going to blow it. You're going to have huge failures. Huge failures. If you could follow me around every day of my life that I was in ministry, huge failures. Huge, all right? Huge. You're going to have them too. The question is, do you stay defeated? Or do you get up and start fighting again? That's the issue. Don't stay in the, in the dirt. Don't stay down. Every time you get knocked down, every time you fall down, get up. Get up. Pray again. Recommit again. And be faithful to the end. Just keep pushing forward. Pushing forward in your own life. Pushing forward in your family. Pushing forward in your church. Just keep pressing forward and be faithful to the end. Go ahead and stand up with me if you would. <clears throat> Did you notice I didn't cough? I didn't... I, it's, it's almost like it kind of cleared up and then as soon as we're done, I'm going to start coughing again. But that's okay. Um, I don't know. You know what? I really don't know. Actually, I struggled with how to take this particular passage and apply it to us because we really don't understand the tribulation that they went through. But we understand that we're in a war. We're in as much of a war as they are. And we just need to know that. I don't know what, what you're going through. I don't know what God has been doing in your life in the recent weeks and in recent wet days. I don't know what He's doing in your life today. But if you need to make any kind of a public response uh, to God today, I'd be happy to talk with you about that and, and pray with you about that. If you would like to come and kneel at the altar and just have business between you and God, that's completely alright. Please feel free to do that. Maybe you have a friend or a deacon or a parent here and you would like for them to pray for you. Just go get them and just take them by the hand and say, hey, would you just pray for me? Tell them whatever it might be. Whatever you need to do this morning, whatever you need to do, you, you do it right now if God is leading you to. We're going to sing.